The resurrection of Jesus is the core event of Christianity, so it's important to get the details straight. Skeptics sometimes issue a challenge to put the events of the day into sequence, and that's what this video does. Uh, I'm going to explain first the issues uh, involved in putting together uh, the different accounts, and then we'll have an animated sequence of the day of the resurrection uh, with timings which might have been correct or might not. So subscribe now to see other videos on the basics of the gospel, and we have in included a, a video on the day of Jesus' crucifixion and a video on evidence for the resurrection. So the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus appear in all four of the, the Gospels, and they also appear in the Acts of the Apostles, and there's a, a short section in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So altogether, there's 165 verses. That sounds like it shouldn't be too difficult to put them together, but in fact, there are quite a lot of complexities involved, 28 different incidents, there are eight main groups of people moving around, and the accounts come from 14 or more different people who are giving information to the writers of the, the Gospels and the Apostle Paul. So putting things together isn't quite so simple as you might think at uh, first sight. You can, however, draw out those incidents into a chart like this, and from that you can start to work out the sequence of operations. So, uh, for example, if you look here, we can have uh, something where uh, there's an event and the arrows show what happens before and what happens after the others. So here, for, for this one, we've got Peter and John start off to run back to the tomb. That happens after Mary Magdalene comes and tells them that the tomb has been opened and the body of Jesus is gone. And uh, they set off before Salome arrives back at their house and they set off before Mary Magdalene sets off herself. And they then run to the tomb and finally they go into it and see what's there. And you can track down the, the actions of different people by uh, looking where they go. So that's in yellow is Mary Magdalene's movements through that sequence of events. Uh, it ends up with her telling the eight disciples, the, the accounts don't tell us what happened next. She may have stayed and met the uh, met Jesus with the other disciples, or she may have gone out with uh, the sorry with the other disciples, or she may have gone out uh, with the women and met Jesus in the streets of Jerusalem. Um, we don't know which of those is the case, but nonetheless, one can use something like this to put together a sequence of events. There are several possible, but uh, one of these we're going to present in a short while. Now, when we look at parallel accounts, there are some issues involved in, in doing this. Uh, first of all, the accounts are summaries. Uh, they're not absolutely everything that happened in every event. They're summaries of the events, and different people will summarize events in different ways. So you don't get word for word the same things happening. You get slightly different accounts of what went on. And uh, when they're reporting what someone said, you might have someone talking for three or four minutes, and you get one verse which has a, an account of what they said. And that could be different in different summaries, so different in different accounts in a way, but they won't be incompatible. Uh, the other thing is that you get lists of names, but when a list of names appears, it's often a list of only those names are interested are in, of interest to the uh, particular person who's writing, the, the, the gospel writer, uh, probably because those are the names that are interest to the people who first read that gospel. So uh, you don't necessarily get everyone who was there listed in any particular account. And the other thing that goes on is that the accounts are not written using the conventions that we have in the, uh, in the 21st century. Instead, 
they use the conventions that were common in the first century, not quite the same, and you'll find things uh, that appear a little odd to us. So, for example, think about the question, how many months of a year have 28 days? Now, you might say, oh, yes, that's just February, it's only one. But the other possible answer would be all of them have 28 days and some of them have more than 28 days. Uh, different ways of looking at the same information using different conventions. We'll look at a couple of the issues before we go on. So this is one about how many women went to the tomb. And if you look at the lists, you'll see that in, in Matthew, we just have uh, two named women, Mary Magdalene and another woman called Mary. In Mark, we've got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and we have a third woman, Salome. Now, Salome is not mentioned by Matthew. That doesn't mean that Matthew didn't know that she was there or didn't think that she was there. It simply means that Matthew wasn't particularly interested in what Salome did, so he didn't write it down. Whereas Mark did know about Salome and the people he was writing for presumably had some idea who Salome was. And so he includes her in the list. Luke doesn't list any names at all uh, in this particular part of his account. And in John, we only get an account only in a mention of Mary Magdalene. So uh, it isn't again that John thinks there was only one woman went. It's because John is only interested or his, his readers are only interested in uh, what Mary Magdalene did. And uh, you'll find that be, be, if you look there, um, what Mary Magdalene actually says uh, shows that there was more than one woman. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Mary is talking for herself and other women as well. So there's more than one woman involved. Mary knew about other people and John knew about other people as well. He just hasn't decided to include them in his particular account. So that's one of the things you have to realize when you look at resurrection accounts, put them together, that they don't necessarily give a list of everybody that was present at every event. Um, the other one that's often raised is the question of when the women went to the tomb and you'll find you get uh, Matthew Ting was towards the dawn. Mark says uh, they, they went uh, very early uh, when the sun had risen. Uh, Luke says at early dawn. Now they're all talking about around the same sort of time, um, but they're not talking about necessarily exactly the same time. And in John, it says while it was still dark that Mary and you've got this problem also the word came to the tomb so there they went to the tomb here you've got the word came to the tomb uh, and some people have deduced from that that the uh, gospel writers thought they'd set off some of them around the time the sun had risen so very early they went to the tomb so they set off uh, when the sun had risen but John has Mary uh, arriving at the tomb while it's still dark. Well, that's actually wrong. Uh, this word here, the ones that are underlined in yellow, is uh, the same Greek word every time. It's echomai, which has a meaning of uh, went. It's not a particularly precise word. It can be translated as went to or came to, and it is in these cases, it's both. Uh, What's happening is at some point on the journey, the sun rose. So the women set off, they probably different women set off at different times. They're not all staying in the same place. And uh, as they go to the, the tomb, the sun starts to rise and they arrive at the tomb around sunrise, having set off not long before sunrise. Um, and finally, the, the last thing that, that people pick up on is the description of who was in the tomb. Uh, John talks about a different event. He talks about angels at the tomb, but that's when Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb at her second visit. These, are, these three are the same. They are the first visit to the tomb. And uh, who was in the tomb? Well, Matthew refers to as an angel. 
Mark describes the person in the tomb as a young man. Luke says there were two young men. So what's going on? Well, what's going on, first of all, is that in the Bible, angels look like human beings. So quite often they're described as men. You actually find the word men used to describe angels. So there's no contradiction there. It's a quite common biblical phrase for the same person to talk about a man coming to see someone and then finding out it was an angel. Um, how many of them are there? Well, uh, remember different women entered the tomb at different times. Uh, they wouldn't all see exactly the same thing as they came in, come in. So Mark, the probably using Salome as a source, as she goes in, she sees a young man, there might be another one just around the corner out of sight. Um, Joanna, who's probably Luke's source, comes in. She sees two men. Uh, some people say, well, were they sitting or were they standing? Uh, well, it's not too difficult for an angel who is standing to sit down or an angel who is sitting to stand up. These are uh, divine beings standing up and sitting down is no difficulty for them. So again, while the accounts are clearly different, hence clearly independent of one another, nevertheless, there's no reason to suppose they're describing different events. They all fit together as summaries. And remember, in the Bible, angels are described as men. So uh, the difference between an angel and a man in the description is not a big one to, to worry about. Okay, let's go on to think about an actual uh, account of what's going on. Uh, incidentally, uh, question four is, have we had a good explanation of the complexity of uh, fitting together the accounts of the resurrection? Let us know in the, the comments. So here we are, this is Jerusalem uh, at the time of Jesus. There are certain places that we, we, where we know where they were from archaeological reasons. So we know where uh, the trials were in the Praetorium. We know where the temple was. Uh, we know where the palace of Herod uh, Antipas, the, the, the Herod of uh, this part of the Gospels, uh, was. That's where he would stay when he was in Jerusalem. We know where Bethany was. We have a fairly good idea where the upper room was, which part of the the, uh, the town of Jerusalem it was in. We may not have the actual building, but we know approximately where it was. And again, the, the best fit for where the, the, the uh, tomb of Jesus was was close to um, Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. And uh, we've got a fairly good idea of where it was on the map. Um, other places, the ones in blue here, are completely speculative. So I've put in uh, a place where John lived. Uh, John's family definitely owned uh, some kind of lodging place in Jerusalem. Um, John's mother was there. Uh, probably she stayed there before the, uh, the crucifixion and after it, for that matter, for the Passover. And we have someone called Cleopas who uh, appears elsewhere. He's the, the, uh, the husband of uh, Mary, one of the Marys who went to the tomb. And I've given him a house as well. He's staying somewhere with his wife. Uh, we have no idea whether either of those is, and I've put them where they are so as to minimize the number of times that the paths of the various disciples cross over one another and make the diagram easier to draw. That's the only reason they're there. It's completely speculative. So let's look at the people. Um, first of all, we, we have a set of people in John's lodging. So uh, there's John's lodging. Uh, John himself uh, would stay there overnight. He's looking after Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, at the, the crucifixion. She was put into his care and he took her back to his house, the house that his family had in uh, Jerusalem at the time. So John's there along with Mary. Uh, we have with that Salome, Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also the mother of John the disciple. It's her house. That's probably why she was staying beforehand. That's she'd also be likely to be there comforting her sister. In the same house, we've got Mary Magdalene. We know that because she leaves in the morning uh, to go to look at the tomb. And we've got Peter. Peter was with John after the arrest of Jesus. And John and Peter went into the high priest's house and saw 
a fair bit of what happened there. So afterwards, they go back to John's house and stay there. That's a fairly likely place for them to be uh, on the Sabbath between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Uh, Joanna is the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. So uh, because of the duties of her husband, she would be staying in Herod's residence, the palace he had uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, we've got Cleopas, he's in the, 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 the house that I've, I've drawn up for Cleopas to stay in, he must have been staying somewhere, there we've put him in, in Jerusalem, and Mary, the mother of James, was his wife, and so she also will be staying probably in the same house. Uh, we have the eight disciples, the one disciple, that's Thomas, uh, disappears, he presumably leaves the other disciples behind at the arrest of Jesus, and he's off the scene. He doesn't appear until after the day of resurrection, and I've sent him to Bethany. Again, we don't know where he went, but Bethany's as good a guess as any. Uh, the eight disciples seem to end up in the upper room, um, and so there they are just before the day of resurrection. So we have different people in different places. When they do things, they're going to start off at different times. So what happens? Well, the day of resurrection begins at sunset, of course, as all Jewish days do. So at 1800 hours on Saturday, the day starts and the markets open. People come out of their houses. The Sabbath is now over. And the women go to the market to buy spices to anoint Jesus with and go home again, and they prepare the spices to anoint Jesus' body with. Notice Joanna doesn't go to the market. The reason for that is she's a wealthy woman. She has got uh, somewhere that she, where she normally stays in Jerusalem. She's likely to have spices already there. She doesn't have to go out and buy them. She might have gone out. We don't know, but there's no reason to suppose she had to do that. Things move on then. We're now looking at the time just before sunset. <clears throat> the women set off from their various lodgings and meet up in, in Jerusalem before they go on to the tomb. So they're meeting somewhere near the tomb and they're going to go on together. And while they're doing that, the tomb is open. An angel opens the tomb. There's a great shaking. Uh, the uh, stone in the front of the tomb is, is more or less blown off it carried away and uh, the guards first of all faint and then uh, they they run away so they're not there when the women arrive so the women carry on from where they've met up and they arrive at the tomb and they see that the tomb is open and it's empty and Mary Magdalene then runs back to tell Peter and John, what's happened. Meanwhile, the uh, women go into the tomb and there they meet angels, one of whom tells them uh, what has happened and tells them to go and, and tell Jesus' disciples. And uh, they set off, but Salome is uh, afraid and she and apparently somebody else go back to John's lodging and there she stays for the rest of the, 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 um, the day's events. Peter and John go to the, see the tomb, they go in, they see it's empty, they don't see anything else apart from they notice the grave clothes there, and finally they go off on their own. The, the women go off to tell the other disciples about the empty tomb. Everyone leaves, the women carry on, they reach the upper room. Uh, John and Peter go off separately from one another and Mary Magdalene arrives at the tomb. Uh, she's probably passed Salome. Salome's gone one way, Mary Magdalene's gone another and they haven't met each other. Um, John carries on to tell the other disciples about it. The women who've told the disciples leave and they're out in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, Mary Magdalene sits in the garden for quite a long time. She's weeping. She's very distressed. And then she looks into the tomb. And when she looks into the tomb, she meets Jesus, who 
maybe outside it's not clear she turns around to see him and doesn't recognize him straight away but then she does and she's the first person to meet jesus alive after the resurrection meanwhile uh, the two disciples set off for emmaus we know that uh, this is before mary magdalene arrives to tell the the uh, eight disciples uh, because Cleopas says to Jesus what he has, what he knows, and it doesn't include Mary Magdalene's evidence. So Cleopas sets off from the upper room and he heads off towards Emmaus. Uh, Mary Magdalene then goes to the upper room and tells the disciples, but initially they don't really believe her. Uh, she tells them about the meeting with Jesus, as I said, they don't believe her. Cleopas carries on walking to Emmaus and Jesus meets uh, the other women in the streets of Jerusalem and tells them to go and tell not his disciples this time but his brothers about his resurrection. Uh, this could have happened quite a lot later. It's not clear exactly when the women left the room or when the women after they left the room met Jesus. Uh, on the way to Emmaus Cleopas meets Jesus along with, of course, a, a companion. There are two of them on the road and they walk together to Emmaus where uh, they can discussing. And in the end, uh, Cleopas persuades Jesus to stay for a meal. He says that the day is moving on. Well, it was, of course, remember, it ends at six o'clock. So uh, even at lunchtime, uh, our lunchtime, the, uh, the day is beginning to reach its end. Jesus disappears, they, they give him a meal, but he breaks bread and then he goes and they don't know where he is. Uh, Cleopas will be setting off back to Jerusalem and Jesus meets Peter in the streets of Jerusalem. So Cleopas is on his way back along with his companion and Peter goes to the other disciples and tells them about the, the uh, fact that he's met Jesus. And that is what happens when the Emmaus two arrive in Jerusalem and find the disciples. Peter has just told them that he has seen Jesus. So by now, nearly everybody, some of the women are outside. Uh, Thomas is still wherever Thomas went to, but there's a huge group of people together in the upper room. And at this point, Jesus comes and talks them all together. And they see him, they, they, they touch him, they feel him, they, no, he's solid. They see him eat some food. Uh, they talk to him for a while. And then Jesus goes away. And presumably they all go back to their homes to sleep the night. The day of the resurrection is now over. So uh, that was a description of the day of the resurrection. So I've put all the events in. None of them is missing. Uh, apart from the, the, the death of Judas, but we don't know exactly when that happened. That's something for a, a, a different look on a different day. So, question for you, have we provided a convincing picture of the day of Jesus' resurrection? The fact that they are so many different accounts and they fit together so well, to me, suggests that these must be an accurate account based on real life events. Have we made that case? Let us know in the comments. Resurrection accounts are independent. They fit together perfectly.